Hello. I am on. Good morning, everyone. Greetings to our people on the computers. We're glad to have you with us. We'll be here every week. <laughs> so please join us when you can. Our uh, lesson study today, we are starting, starting the book of Proverbs. And our memory text. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. I want to deal with the fear of the Lord. That's the one that a lot of people have problems with. Fear of the Lord. If you look that book up, or that word up in the concordance, which explains the words in the Bible, you will find that it means reverence. Reverence of the Lord, not fear. Fear of the Lord is a, um, a degree of it, because those you reverence, you also fear to a degree. But reverence of the Lord is, is the beginning of wisdom. And if you look that word up in the concordance, which gives you, it's like a dictionary for Bible words, it will give you fear as reverence. And well, fear is love. Yeah, well, that's all part of reverence. You can't revere someone you don't love. You really can't. You have to have feelings there. You can't do otherwise. Emphasizing the importance of true wisdom. That is what the book of Proverbs does. Wisdom is a tree of life, a creative power, and more precious than gold or rubies. Without this capacity to discern between good and evil, one cannot live a meaningful life. Wisdom not only is the ability to distinguish between good and evil, but also involves following, not just knowing, but following what is right, thus acknowledging and honoring God in our daily lives. Wisdom is the motivation for following a prudent path to a fulfilling life. This wisdom comes from above and is rooted in fear of the Lord or reverence of the Lord. Fearing God results in accepting and responding to God's grace. To fear the Lord, I just saw it, didn't I? <laughs> to fear the Lord means to fear, to grieve him. We don't want to grieve the Lord. I don't, <laughs> definitely don't want to grieve the Lord. <laughs> to fear God means to respect him and his will, making all our decisions in regard to him. A faithful child, parent, or spouse will always make all his, decision, his or her decisions in regard and respect to loved ones. Similarly, we ought to make all our decisions in regard to God, his word, his law, his will. Biblically, to fear means to revere and worship God. Did you push the button on? Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay, there we are. Uh, there's another aspect to fear. Um, I think somebody mentioned love, which is there. Um, and it's a response also in Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter. It, it brings the two together, and there's other, many other references in Deuteronomy 29, 529, um, that we would have a heart that would fear him, a heart that would love him, and keep all my commandments. 
and it fits in very well with the three angels' message. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the, this is the last day message as well, is to reverence God and to remember his commandments to mm -hmm. do them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, love and respect. Yes. Yep. To fear God means to love and obey him. The concept of love in the notion of fear is, is not present in our modern languages. This dimension is lost and preserved only in the, bib in the biblical Hebrew. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. And that's from Deuteronomy 10, 12 and 13. Yeah. Yeah. To fear God means to be in love with him in total submission and admirable obedience. To fear God means to cultivate the awareness that he is present. He always sees us. We cannot flee from his presence, and his eye is constantly on us. He is a caring, loving parent. The eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him. Psalms 33, 18. The fear of God is an acute consciousness of God's eyes upon us and having the full assurance that we are living in his presence. In order to cultivate a sense of awe before God, we need to enjoy his presence, sense his holiness, and maintain a correct trembling before his grace and love. Fifteen. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, superior to his creation in every way. God is not only our equal partner, is not our, God is not our equal partner or a sentimental God, but a consuming fire and the God of faithful love. To be aware of the presence of God, to be aware that he is with us every every minute, every second of our lives. He is standing beside us. He is with us. Makes it pretty hard to sin when you're aware of the presence of God. Makes it pretty hard to not love him when you are aware that he loves you so much that he spends all that time with you just to protect you to make sure you're doing okay. You love someone, you wanna be with them. God wants to be with us and we want to be with him. That is the fear of the Lord. Now I'm on um, Sabbath afternoon's lesson. From Eden onward, the root of human tragedy lies in wrong choices. Man lost all because he chose to listen to the deceiver rather than to him who is truth, who alone has understanding. By the mingling of evil with good, his mind had become confused. <coughs> the book of Proverbs is all about helping us make the right choices to choose the way of God and not that of the deceiver. The choices we make are literally matters of life and death, and life eternal or death eternal. In the first three chapters of Proverbs, the first three chapters of Proverbs illustrate this method of education. After explaining the purpose of the book, to know wisdom, and having laid down the motto of the book, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the author moves back and forth from warning us against listening to foolishness to urging us to respond to the call of heavenly wisdom. 
someone um, read Proverbs 1, 20, 21? Who's got a mic? Everybody trying to pass the mic off to the other guy. <laughs> 21. 2021. Okay. <clears throat> Proverbs 20. Pro no, Pro Proverbs, Proverbs 1, 1 20. 20, 21. All right, got it. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses and at the openings of the gates in the city. She speaks her words. So, wisdom is out in the open, saying, come to me, let me help, while the sinners lie in wait and lurk secretively. Wisdom calls aloud outside, cries out in the chief concourses, speaks her words. Wisdom is here being personified and her offer is given to man, to the man and the woman on the street. It's for everyone in the real business of life. Proverbs 1, 22 to 32, speaks of rejecting wisdom. We won't read it, it's a very long passage. The reason that people reject wisdom has nothing to do with wisdom itself and everything to do with the character of those who reject her. These are described as arrogant and disdainful, as if they knew better. The implication is that wisdom is for the naive and the simple, and yet those who reject wisdom are simple and naive. They are fools who hate knowledge. When we reject wisdom from above, we often end up with fables and lies that we fabricate for ourselves or fables and lies that others fabricate for us, and that we do so readily accept. In this way, we replace God with idols. Ironically, those who despise re re religion, mocking those they judge as simple and naive, are often as superstitious in their own way, placing value on the most fleeting and useful things that in the end can ne never satisfy the most basic needs of the heart. Have you, ever, have you ever met someone like that? They'll laugh at you because you believe in God, and yet if a black cat crosses their path, oh my goodness, they gotta go around the block. Can't cross that black cat's path because that's bad luck. Or astrology, you check out their... Yeah, the check out their horoscope. It, it, it's crazy. Numerology, they'll check the numbers of everything. Is today a good day or a bad day? Got to look up their horoscope in the newspaper. Um, oh, what is his name? Can't think of the name of one of the um, evangelists. His mother wrote horoscopes. And when she was busy, Doug Batchelor, that's it. Yes, Doug Batchelor's mother wrote horoscopes. When she was busy, she would just use an old one. Boy, oh boy. And it made no difference. Nobody said, now wait a minute. This day didn't turn out like it was supposed to in my horoscope. Quite a, quite a way to run a ball game. Let's look at Proverbs 2, 1 to 5. Yep, the value of wisdom. Somebody read it for us. Two, one to five? Yep, please. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. 
Three times the discourse is introduced with the conjunction if, marking three stages in the progression of education. The first if introduces the passive, passive stage of listening, that is simply being receptive and attentive. The second if introduces the active response of crying and asking for freedom, for wisdom, sorry. The third if introduces pa passionate involvement in seeking and searching for wisdom as we would for hidden treasures. I like that. Seeking and searching for wisdom as we would for hidden treasures. And wisdom is definitely a treasure, especially knowledge of the Lord. Can there be any greater treasure than knowledge of the Lord? In Proverbs 2, 6 to 9, we um, have the phrase, the Lord gives, in response, in response to the phrase, you will find the knowledge of God. Wisdom, like salvation, is a gift from God. This paragraph describes the divine work. He gives wisdom, he stores wisdom, he guards and preserves the way of the wise. You guys aren't doing any talking out there. Let's have some talking. I don't know what questions to ask. Are you wise? Who, who has discovered the wisdom of the Lord? We all search for it. Do we find it? We ask for wisdom. Joyce, you really look like you want to say something. <laughs> you know what I, what I have observed in this church, with the pioneers especially, some of them are right here, is that you know, they have experience in life that is shaped by their religious experience. And when they speak, they do speak wisdom uh, out of their experience, but uh, with discernment as well. Mm -hmm. And I have noticed several in this church that are very, I would say, fun to listen to because uh, as humble as they are, they have, you know, when they say something, these are words of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a gift. Again, like we're talking about, it's God-given. Yes. Yes, definitely. You have to be close to God to, to know that wisdom, to know God. Experience in life is important, too. If people know how to use the experiences of life in a wise way to share advice or knowledge with others as well. Yeah. But wisdom, there are many who, who believe they are wise, and yet they don't have the wisdom of God. They don't walk with God. They don't know God. Their wisdom is for nothing. Their That's wisdom gains right from nothing. Wrong, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Wisdom comes from God. Knowledge comes from man. And it's not even well, necessarily good knowledge. <laughs> well, I don't know if we can draw those distinctions so much because, you know, all things are from God. I mean, we're just discovering mm -hmm. them. Basically. Well, when I say wisdom comes yeah. from God, I'm including... I'm including uh, I'm including knowledge in there because obviously everything comes from God. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, not that I disagree. It, um, I don't even know if this is on, but I, I thought it had said um, in Proverbs 1, 1 and 2 that that is where um, knowledge begins. So we can't say that knowledge is from man. 
No, and, and right. I don't really mean knowledge is from man. Right. Man has knowledge. It's not from himself. But man, a, a, um, a man can have knowledge and not wisdom. Yeah. But all wisdom and knowledge comes from God. Those who are with God can gain wisdom and knowledge. <laughs> you know, our, our, you take our society, it values knowledge. You know, degrees and education yeah. and uh, science and all of that. But I guess the question is, is it anchored in, in, in God's d direction? Is it anchored in uh, uh, a source from God? I mean, the, the prime example is evolution and creation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of knowledge there, but it's misinterpreted knowledge of God uh, instead of the true knowledge of God. Have any of you ever watched the um, TV program Creation Magazine? There's another one, Creation something else, and I can't remember what it is. Yeah, I, I really enjoy those, mag those stories. They talk about, um, oh, evolution and, and the ridiculousness of it all. And... Uh, <sighs> Some of the stuff that they bring out, my gosh. I don't know how scientists can be so silly. They, they, they have a tree that's standing in, in the earth in an upright position that's been covered by layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of mud. And they say, well, it was laid down, for, laid down like that for 10,000 years. Excuse me? That tree just stood there. It never rotted. It never did anything. It just stood there and waited for this dirt to cover it up for 10,000 years. Like yeah, it, it's just, it's ridiculous. The the flood. Yes, yes. It's just ridiculous. Those are very good, very good shows. They're on um, Channel 4, Vision, and they are very good. And I highly recommend them. Oh, on Bell. oh, 65 on Bell, okay. Now I don't know, remember where I was. When we reject wisdom from above, we often end up with fables and lies that we fabricate for ourselves or the fables and lies that others fabricate for us and that we do so readily accept. Boy, isn't that the truth. Yeah, we need a mic over here. Well, I, I look at, it says they're the beginning of knowledge, and in, in Proverbs they're talking about knowledge the Bible has given us, but knowledge is only good so far if, as we take it. I mean, we, we, we have deciphered, there's so many religions out there, and they've looked at the Bible and look what they've done with it because I, mean, I, I look at this I, and I can see what God's word says but there are things that some religions have taken and sort of yeah we, we don't really take it that way but the Bible says it but we don't really take it that way yeah we, we look at it differently so they, they twist knowledge I mean they're, they're twisting the I guess the knowledge of the Bible, right? I don't know. Makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, it's just like, uh, thank you. Along with what you're saying, David, and the class, I think it's just like uh, liberal theology nowadays, and for more than 100 years, has tried to uh, reinterpret the miracles and the supernatural events of the Bible and make them just on a, on a human level or a natural level. 
And, and that's another example of reinterpreting the Bible, uh, not accepting what it says, taking it as it, as it is from the Word of God. You know, it's interesting. We're, we're so willing to... I was talking to a gentleman this morning, and he says he can't believe the Bible. It's all just a fairy tale. He says it doesn't make sense. What did he you says, tell him? It's just not right. What so what did you tell him? And, and I didn't Hold the mic close. I didn't know what to say. Is it on? It's yes. On. Well, everybody else put the... No, 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 no. We have to let it ring. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, he, he, does, he does not believe in the Bible at all because he says it's fairy tales. What I find and I is says, well, I believe in it, yeah. and I go to church on the Sabbath. That's, that's a good testimony, Wilda. I think that... Um, I think I find that most people that say, you know, some things like she said, this gentleman said, they haven't really even read the Bible. Yeah. yeah. That's it. And, and how can you give a, a book report on a book that you haven't read? I think also it's, it's interesting that people will say that they can't believe the Bible. It's all just a fairy tale. It's all made up. But they'll believe all this stuff about evolution. Come on. One day a dinosaur was walking across the swamp and his tail fell off so no dinosaurs no longer had tails. <laughs> it's just absolutely ridiculous the stuff they've come up with. And, and the stuff that they have disproven that they can ignore. We won't speak of that. You know? <laughs> yeah, if, that's right. If it doesn't fit, let's ignore it. Let's pretend it's not there. Scientists cannot disprove God and creation. Scientists, have, scientists cannot prove it, that God didn't, ex you know, God doesn't exist, that Jesus Christ didn't exist. Scientists cannot prove it. They can, uh, uh, archaeologists know for sure that uh, there are, I mean, the, Egypt is there. There are things in Egypt that uh, 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 that prove the existence of David, uh, mm -hmm. Solomon. They, they, you know, they, they, they've seen. Uh, what's the other gentleman that's in the Bible? Um, Moses. Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Exactly. They, they, they've proven all these things. So, so th there are links out there that prove the Bible. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot of truth in the Bible. And, and almost yearly, they, they're proving more. More and more and more and more and more is being found. And they discount that. They, they ignore it. They turn from it because it doesn't say what they want it to say. And not only that, then they're wrong. And they've been wrong all along. Well, they don't want to be wrong. They're the smartest people on earth. So... That means that they're right and the Bible's wrong. And what happens when things go sour in their life? Who do they turn to? Yes. Yeah, well, like, like they say, there's no atheists in the foxholes. And that's, I For think, sure. a very true saying. Who, who are you going to turn to when you need some help? I think that we have to uh, separate the fact that there are liberal theologians and uh, people who discount the Bible in these ways, and there are others who are believers and who build on the Bible, mm -hmm. evangelicals, who recognize the truth of archaeology and, and it proves the Bible uh, that it is true. Yes. Yeah, I think just we have to make that extinction, distinction. Not everyone out there no, is, definitely not. is singing yeah. the same song. Yeah, the Seventh-day Adventists do not have a firm grip on on religion and knowledge of the Lord and the rest of the world just a bunch of atheists who believe in evolution. That's not the way it is. But we have a lot of churches in the world today. We do. Oh, the, yes, there is a lot of churches and a lot of denominations. I mean, in our church, the Seventh-day Adventist churches, 
There are a lot of them in the world today, a lot more than I ever thought. Oh, yes, and they're, we're growing. And we're still growing. When wisdom enters your heart, it marks the final stage of conversion. Not only will we enjoy the knowledge of the Lord, but it will be a pleasant experience to our souls. Do you ever just think about God and all of a sudden you just feel that welling up inside you and it's just, I don't know, sometimes I just, it's so much love and just overwhelms you. It's a wonderful feeling. You know, just to prove the Bible again, I was hunting for this because I just read it this morning, so I'm taking us back a sec, and now I have to find it again. Here it is. <coughs> I didn't have a lesson quarterly this week. For some reason, I didn't pick one up, so I was just reading in Proverbs this week, and this is Proverbs 10, verse 26, and it says, As vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the lazy man to those who send him. But what spoke to me is, I don't know if any of you watch commercials on TV and you know that acid is bad for the teeth. And they now have all these new toothpastes that are supposed to protect the teeth because acid wears them down. I mean, how did he know this? Way back in Bible times, they're just finding this out in our new day and yeah. age. And he says, as vinegar is oh, to yeah. the teeth. So yeah. if somebody Mike. thinks this is just fairy tales, turn them to Proverbs 10, verse 26, yeah. and show them that vinegar is to the teeth. I mean, acid is bad for the teeth. Solomon knew it way, way, way back yeah. then. It's not fairy tales. Yeah. There are many things in Proverbs. Many, many, yes. But this is just a very relevant one because people watch TV and they see the commercials and they know that acid is bad for the teeth. I mean... You know, we're just finding this out now, and I was just so amazed when I read that. I'm sure I've read it many times in the past, but as a medical professional, it just spoke to me. Yeah, yeah I agree. The, the Bible is full of things like that, that if a person will read it and accept it, I just wanted to comment, you know, about the ant, and it tells about how you need to work for a living and prepare for winter. And many things in Proverbs are like that. Yes, yeah. Proverbs is a wonderful book. It really is. Um, we could read it over and over and not get it all. Though we are sinners, we don't have to fall into evil. The ones depicted as on the wrong path, must have first left the right path. We were born on the wrong path. We chose our path. Wickedness then is understood, first of all, as a lack of faithfulness. Sin begins subtly and innocently. But before long, the sinner not only does wickedly, but also enjoys it. And that's enjoys it. Ooh, that's not good. We don't want to be enjoying wicked. Did you hear in the news about that young fellow who picked up a baby from a party he was basically thrown out of for fighting, picked up this baby, carried her through the back alley, deposited her in a recycle bin, and kept on going. Fortunately, somebody else came along. He was on his way home, and he heard her crying in this recycle bin. She's wearing a diaper and a T-shirt. It's the middle of the winter. Minus 30. Minus 30. Minus 30. And they're not positive she will live. It was a wonder she wasn't frozen. It's a wonder she had the energy to cry. Proverbs 3, 7 says, do not be wise in your own eyes. 
fear the Lord and depart from evil. Do not be wise in your own eyes. And you know, so many of us are. I don't know necessarily so many of us. I think we all are to a degree. We all think we got the answers for certain things. We don't think we've got the answers for everything. But we all think we've got the answers for certain things. This is where the answers are, folks. This is where the answers are. They really are. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in this case, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It doesn't mean stand around and be afraid of God. That's not going to help. <laughs> that re it means respect the Lord. It means listen to the Lord. It means stand in awe of the Lord. It means all those things and then some. There is more hope for a fool than someone who thinks they are wise in their own eyes. More hope for a fool. To be wise means to keep God's commandments, to display mercy and truth, and to trust in the Lord. Wisdom implies an intimate relationship with God. Note the repeated reference to the heart, the seat of our personal response to God's influence. You know, I, I learned this as a child growing up. My father was one of the most humble men that I think um, I have known. I and will agree with you there. <laughs> I gave him a compliment. He would always say, thank God. And he would give God the credit. And I'm still working on this one myself. And I have to say that we have life and health and breath only because of him. I mean, we live. Our, our very existence is because of him. And when we realize that we can do nothing in and of ourselves, mm -hmm. it is all from him. Every word, you know, should be praise God. Thank him for the ability to do this, for the wisdom, for the knowledge. Yes. I start every day and I pray and ask him to lead me and guide me for that day and to help me with everything that I do. And, and when I use any of my talents, it is because he has given them to me and he has graced me with them that I even have that ability to do that thing. And I think it is very uh, difficult for us to remember to do that. And you know, I've been praying and and God has been giving me those words, but not all the time yet. So I'm, I'm still working on that one. That one's still on my to-do list. <laughs> Thank you, Ingrid. That was very good. Happy is the man who finds wisdoms. Proverbs 3.13. Happy is the man who finds wisdom. And wisdom is of the Lord. So if you've found wisdom, you've found the Lord also. Because you don't get one without the other. Wisdom is associated with life and health. One of the most suggestive images is the tree of life. A promise repeated several times in the book. This metaphor alludes to the Garden of Eden. This promise does not mean that the acquisition of wisdom will provide eternal life. Instead, the idea is that the quality of life with God, which our first parents enjoyed in Eden, can, to some measure, be recovered. When we live with God, we get some inkling, some hints of Eden. Even better, we learn to hope in the promised recovery of, his lost, of this lost kingdom. Why is the need for wisdom so vital? Why do we need wisdom? Well, you have to deal with wounds and troubles that you... No, it... The opposite of that is that we'll have to deal with our own wounds and, and troubles that we bring about from wrong choices. Yes, very much so. Very much so. 
The sudden re reference to the creation story seems to be out of place in this context, yet the use of wisdom at creation reinforces the argument of verse 18. Let's read verse 18, 318. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. And that is wisdom. Which is, it associates wisdom with the tree of life. If God used wisdom to create the heavens and the earth, wisdom is not a trivial matter. The scope of wis wisdom is cosmic going beyond the limits of our earthly existence. Wisdom concerns our eternal life as well. This lesson is implied in the reference to the tree of life, reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. This perspective is also contained in the promise that concludes our passage, the wise shall inherit glory. Karen, when you read uh, 18, I just noticed verse 17. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and her paths are peace. Yes. Yes, wisdom, yeah. Wisdom, not of the world, not of, not necessarily not of the world, World, not of the worldly, but of the world as created by God. The wisdom that comes from God, the wisdom that is God, it, it, it's... How does fearing God open the way for gaining true knowledge and wisdom? How does fearing God open the way for gaining true knowledge and wisdom? You need a mic. Please, hold it very close. Hi, everybody. My name is Monica, and uh, I'm new here. This is my first time. I met with Pastor Harold yesterday. And, Hold um, it closer, please. Okay, so thank you. God grants us insight to direct our paths when we accept wisdom into our hearts. It's a precious gift. Yes, yes. Wisdom comes from God. Pastor Howard, you look like you really want to say something. Uh, it slipped my mind, unfortunately. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Want a drink of water? <laughs> well, that depends on whether it's true wisdom or false wisdom. People think they're wise and they don't know. What but false wisdom isn't wisdom. False wisdom is just a perception of wisdom. I was talking to a guy this morning who didn't believe the Bible. Well, yes, you told us about that. Yeah, yeah. He thinks he's wise. Yes, yeah. The call of wisdom to live in God's presence enables people to discern between good and evil and to do what is right. Do you feel that? Living in God's presence, and we all do, do you feel that you know the difference between good and evil? Can you tell the difference? I hope so. I hope so too. different variations of good and evil because we have been desensitized to to I guess a perception of evil or, or, or good because you, you watch television nowadays and what we would watch way back when you know um, 
little things have slipped in that sort of turned things around and made it okay. Because society has said, well, yeah, it, it, well you, you, what's on television now? I mean, what you can see on TV now compared to what you saw before is quite, quite dramatic. I mean, all the killings and everything else you see on TV, you, you wouldn't see that back in, in, in the day. Uh, it, so, and back then, when, when I guess probably the first time you saw somebody being killed on TV, it was like, oh my, like they actually, this, you know. The, the sad part about it is, with all that goes on on TV, is we become desensitized to these things. You see somebody being killed on TV the first time, and, <laughs> and the second time, it's not quite as much, and the third and the fifth and the hundredth time, it's, oh well, c'est la vie. And, and, there, and then there's, there's the, 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 the family relationship. Right? Yeah. I mean, family relationship and the family, there was respect in a time, and, and there, there's supposed to be respect, but the way it's going now, that's being lost because it's, they, they can show something where uh, a son will, you know, tell off mother or, or, and ha, 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 it's a big joke, laugh, laugh, laugh. It's not right, yeah. but, you know, there's stuff like that that goes on. Yeah. It's, it's the way our society has changed. Wanda? I think this incident with this young man and the baby, he's probably watched this kind of, stuff and played these kind of games all his life. Mm -hmm. He has no respect for life. Mm -hmm. um, and probably has not been taught respect. Well, in, in doing this, he was going to hurt the mother. So, you know, okay. Yeah. She threw me out of the party. I'll fix her. She'll be sorry. Yeah. But to destroy a life so that you can fix somebody who threw you out of a party? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yep, I definitely. I just wanted to say, um, speaking about the difference between wisdom and, and uh, not having wisdom, so we have to start with God. We have to know what he says, and what he says wisdom is, and we have to believe him. Anything else is, mm -hmm. is uh, yeah. not helpful. Yes, yep. Wanda, you want to close us in prayer, please? Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts for your love and your compassion for us. We thank you, dear Jesus, that you are the one who brings us knowledge and wisdom. And we pray that we can tell the difference and that we may make the choices that you want us to make that are the wise ones. I pray for each one here. And I pray for those who are not here, those who are ill, those who are um, perhaps away still. And I just pray that you will keep, bring back everyone safely and bring back the ones who are ill. And Lord, I just want to pray for Grant as he goes back up north, that you will be with him and keep him in good health. And um, I just... Uh, Thank you and praise you for all you've done for us. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. Could I give a report in just a second? Yeah. Um, Boyd. I don't know if some of you are aware that Boyd ended up in the hospital. No. Yeah. And I didn't know till yesterday I was visiting Monica <laughs> at the hospital. And uh, then I saw Cindy there. And so uh, she would mentioned, and we went up, and Boyd had some congestive heart problems, but he's doing better now. Good, good, good. And uh, Richard is coming along, but he looked a little bit worn out yesterday. He's, uh, he's doing some walking. So step by step, let's keep praying for them. Yep. My brother got through his uh, hip surgery very well. He's doing extremely well, so I'm very thankful for prayers for that. Okay. That's it, folks. Oh, good. He is in a facility now. It's called Lewis Estates Retirement Residence, and he has a little suite. It's got a bedroom, a living room, and kitchenette, and he just loves it. Oh. And he loves the people there, and he is so happy, and um, I'm really grateful. So Amen. he good. is doing well.
Good, good, good. I'm very happy to be here. I know I can turn this off somewhere.
Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome. And also, Happy New Year. The, the songs that um, I wanted to say that I've chosen, but it was, uh, thank you, Mr. Smith, and they all have the word snow in them because it's been snowing and cold, and uh, so come sing with us. Our first one is 184, Jesus Paid It All. Sabbath. Happy New Year. Well, I welcome everyone this morning. I know there's a few more out in the foyer or just late coming in. Welcome our visitors. We had some visitors this morning. Uh, we welcome uh, Monica Downey, who's with us this morning. And we welcome those on live streaming uh, to our service. Just a few announcements. Uh, you can check all the announcements in your bulletin. Uh, I want to just mention that uh, for those who, who are familiar with the uh, family of Adele Sell, there's a funeral uh, for her at the Bicycler Seventh-day Adventist Church on Tuesday, January the 6th at 3 p.m. Uh, You'll notice on the back of your bulletin, uh, there's a scripture there from Numbers 624. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. From Numbers 624 to 26. And the, the comment in my Bible refers to this as 
the Old Testament Lord's Prayer. Just thought I'd bring that to your attention. Um, there's a Sabbath school council meeting on Thursday, January the 8th at 7 p.m. for those of you who are on the Sabbath school council. And uh, on a personal note, I just want to uh, thank the church family. Uh, for the fruit basket and all your prayers while I was in the hospital uh, earlier this week. Appreciate it so much. Uh, your prayers certainly helped. And on another personal note, <laughs> just to let you know, most of you do know that I'll be leaving tomorrow morning. Uh, going back to Nunavut for couple of months, going to a place called Iglulik. Iglulik, the first part of that word is spelled igloo, and you all know that means a, a, a house or a snow house. And Iglulik just means a place of many houses. It's a place I was in 10 years ago. Uh, I took over as town manager there 10 years ago when they were had some problems, and I hired a new town manager 10 years ago, and he's still basically still there as a town manager, but he had a stroke uh, about two weeks ago, so the mayor asked if I would come back again and look after things until Brian gets back. And you might uh, uh, just remember Brian in your prayers that he would recover, and I can uh, look after things for him and come back here. One more announcement, uh, uh, thank you card. I was asked to read, it's not signed, it's anonymous, but it says, Dear Church Family, I would like to thank the Seventh-day Adventist Church for their generous gift to Jesus this past uh, Christmas season. Your gift, gifts made it possible for our family to to have a Christmas while still being able to meet our needs. I've always felt like a participant, but not a part of the church family. Thanks to you, thanks to your love, I now, I now feel a part. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And that's all the announcements this morning. Our second song this morning is uh, number 279, Only Trust Him.
third song is uh, number 318, Whiter Than Snow. Thank you for singing. Well, we have all that fresh white snow outside, and now we know something is whiter than snow. It's hard to imagine when we see how nice that new white snow is out there. One uh, announcement I forgot to mention is the Veggie Supper Club is tomorrow, January 4th at 5 p.m. here at the church. Today's offering is for the Medicine Hat Church family budget. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is a worldwide movement, but the local church, this Medicine Hat Church, is the center of church ministry. Sabbath school, divine worship, programs, community services, evangelism, many other programs and the activities take place in thousands of Seventh-day Adventist churches around the world, including Medicine Hat. These activities take place because church members, like yourselves, generously give of their time, talents, and means. Today is the first Sabbath of the new year. I thank you for supporting the programs of this congregation in Medicine Hat. As we look forward to this year, may each of us commit to supporting our Medicine Hat congregation so that the Lord will be glorified in our community. Today's offering 
is for the ministries and operations of the Medicine Hat Church. Let us be faithful stewards by returning the tithes and giving an offering according to the means that God has entrusted us. In Proverbs 11.25, we're told that the generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. A comment in my Bible says, the generous person will receive generously. At the start of this year, let us thank God for the blessings we receive when we are faithful with our tithe and generous with our offerings. God is generous with us. Let us also be generous. Will the deacons come forward, please? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your people here in Medicine Hat. We thank you for the generosity towards you. We thank you for the offerings given this morning. And we pray, Lord, that you would use it to further your kingdom on earth and to further your work here in Medicine Hat. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a garden of prayer down here. Anyone who wishes to come for prayer, please come. in heaven we thank you so much for this sabbath morning we thank you father for all your goodness to us 
for us. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this place, that your Holy Spirit would fall upon each one that is here this morning and rest upon each one throughout the day to bring honor and glory to you, to help us live lives pleasing to you. We thank you, Father, for answer prayer. You answer all our prayers, and we thank you for it. You're such a great and mighty God, and we give you all the praise. Father, we have many people who need your healing touch this morning. There are lonely people, sick people. Father, we pray for Susie Stanton, who still needs your touch on her. We pray for Richard Nelson for his continued improvement. We pray for Alex Belinsky. Father, we pray for AJ traveling mercies as he's out on the highway today. And Father, we pray for Jason Handley. He's in emergency now. And we have prayer requests in our prayer boxes from someone unsigned asking for For restoration of their marriage. Father, we we pray for a newborn baby. Uh, her name is Athena. She has a respiratory virus. Father, we know that you hear our prayers, and we know that you answer, and we thank you so much for that. And Father, we pray for Pastor Kay. Thank you for bringing he and Mrs. Kay here safely, and we pray that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit as he brings us your word this morning, and we ask that you would help us to hear what you want us to hear from your word. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you this morning? Good. It's good to see you today in church. You know, have someone, when you have done something really, really good, has given you a high five. Do you know what does that mean? Say, good job. What is that like this? Good job. High five. You know, where I work, I'm going to wait till the girls are sitting. No, that's can sit right there. Sit in a spot, do it. You know, where I work, we said, oh, you need to show five or give me five. And you know what that means? We have five little visuals. And one said, quiet body, listening ears, looking eyes, quiet mouth. And the last one, Julia? Yeah. Is, um, the whole body we need to stop, like you guys are showing me five right now. But in some cases, in my school, there's kids that they don't have listening ears. They don't have quiet bodies. And they think they can do whatever they want in the classroom. Have you had friends like that at your school sometimes? So at those moments, we have to remind the kids and say, uh-oh, oh, you're not showing me your walking feet or stuff. 
For that reason, I want to show you some pictures and some things that happen sometimes at school. And I would like that after I show you a picture, you will tell me what should we do in those situations, okay? For example, the first picture, this, this is a kid, and what is he doing? Eating. What is he eating? It looks like a big cookie. He is eating a big cookie. And someone, we're not going to say who because this is the story. You have to tell me what happened. Someone saw that Kay, this is the girl, put her cookie, half a cookie she ate, and the rest she put it in her backpack. But someone in the school thought it was a good idea go and check in her backpack, take the cookie, and eat the rest. Is that a good thing to do? No, what that person should, should do, do you think? Because that, then when she went to check her backpack, she noticed that her cookie was missing. What she should do? What that person should do? The one who ate the cookie. What should we do as Christians? If we did something we didn't know sometimes, and then we think, and then we say, uh-oh, I think that was wrong. What should we do? Think about it. Should we go say sorry? Or just walk away and say, oh, who cares? What should we do? I think that's a good idea. What about tell mommy about it or daddy, and then the next day bring a nice cookie to that person and say, I'm sorry I ate the rest of your cookie. That would be a good thing to do? I think so, too. The next picture. And this time, you give me your answer. I help you with the first one. You look. In your school, probably, there's a nice set of flowers. And on the desk, there was a big plant. And somehow, you run around it and bump the flower pot. And the, what happened to the flower pot? Broke. It broke. And all the dirt went into the carpet. You got so scared that you walk away from it. And then when the teacher came inside the classroom, he saw the mess in the carpet. And he said, what happened here? And you stay quiet. What should you do at that point? What should we say? Sorry. 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 Me. 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 Right. What should we do with the mess in the floor? We leave it like that? No. That's right. Good answer, kiddos. This one here. You and your friend were having a race, and you wanted to see who could get first to the classroom. In the meantime, when you were running, you accidentally pushed the girl in front of you, and she fell, and she hit her head. She began to cry and told the teacher that someone pushed her. When the teacher asked if someone pushed her, you said that you didn't. Is that a good thing to say? What should we do at that point? Sorry. Should we say it was me or should we say it wasn't me? It, is me? it was me. Even if it hurts, right? We have to say the truth. That's right. My last one here. Here. Look at the picture. Eric was at the paint center with Anna. And Eric started to wipe the paint all over the desk chair and on the wall. And Anna told the teacher that Eric was swiping paint on everything. When the teacher spoke to Eric, Eric said that he didn't wipe paint anywhere. Eric said it wasn't him. Is that OK to say? No. no. What would she say at that point? always say the truth. truth we will get it we will get in trouble sometimes when we say the truth yes we will sometimes we will get in trouble but that is better to keep that in your heart so I want to I want to share with you one memory verse and remember that you learn with your mommies and daddies about the Ten Commandments there's one that it says that you don't need to bear false testimony about anybody that means that we cannot say lies or say that it wasn't me when we did something wrong. Okay, so I want that you remember that. And there's one more that it says, um, 
in uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, is that let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So when we follow those 10 happy rules, we will be happy or sad? Happy. happy. That's right. Thank you for listening. You guys were good. Go get your baskets. Thank you. Father in heaven, we have responded to your invitation to come and worship you in your presence today. And as we begin this new year, we thank you for the many reasons we have to worship you. May our presence here bring joy to your heart this day, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our song is called uh, Cover With His Life, number 412.
The scripture reading this morning, you join with me with your Bibles, is Genesis chapter 1, verse 31 to chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning, church. And happy new year. Good to see each of you here this morning. I'm excited about what the church has decided to do, and I hope that you've received your copy of the story. If you haven't, Make sure to stop by the office as you leave and you'll receive your copy. And I would recommend that you, um, right now, just if you have it, open it and put your name in it. Because there's a lot of other people that have the same book that you do. And if you leave it sitting somewhere, somebody else might pick it up and think it's theirs. And so put your name in it. And, uh, and we're going to be working our way through the story, uh, through the Bible story, this year. And um, I, I have a, a prayer for us as a church as we look at His story, the story of God relating to His children, to, to us, His people, and to mankind. And my, my prayer is uh, found actually in Ephesians, and I invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. And um, in Ephesians, Paul is actually praying a prayer for the church in Ephesus. And uh, this is his prayer. Ephesians 3, starting at verse 14, he says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So he's praying that through God's riches, and God is probably the richest being in the universe, that through God's riches we will be strengthened. And why? This is why. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. His prayer is that we will fall in love again, that we will know the length, the depth, the breadth, the height of God's love for us. And by discovering that, we will fall deeper in love. And my prayer is that as we review the story of God's saving work for mankind as recorded in the Bible, that we will, as individuals, fall deeper in love. That's my prayer. And so each week, I'm going to be praying that prayer and reading that verse, claiming that promise for us as a church, and I invite you to, to do the same. So the first chapter covers 11, this first 11 chapters of Genesis. And when you look at that, and, and, I, and I realized, you know, we, we estimate that, that this world is about 6,000 years old. The first 11 chapters of Genesis covers a span of 2,000 years. From the creation to Abraham. So in 11 chapters, that's a lot of time. Because Abraham's life alone takes 15 chapters in the book of Genesis. 
So you can realize there's, we're, we're brushing with really broad strokes the first 11 chapters in Genesis. So you basically got three sections. You've got from creation to Abraham is 2,000 years. From Abraham to Jesus is 2,000 years. And then from Jesus to our time is 2,015 years. And we're, you know, we're approximating within 50 years or so. We're not being really exact. And so there's kind of these three sections of time. And, and so today, I hope that you brought a lunch because I'm covering 2,000 years of this world's history. Well, no, I'm not going to take a lot of detail, but there are five major events that happen in the first 11 chapters. There's creation, there's the fall, and we've talked back a while ago about the fall and how what was important about the deception that the serpent uh, deceived Eve with and, and how he distorted God's character. And, and then there's the story of Cain and Abel, and then the story of Noah and the flood. There's a couple of little tidbits in that story that I want to bring out. We're not going to focus on that story. We're going to actually go back to creation, but... Um, Turn with me to Genesis 6 and, um, and verse 6. It's just a little glimpse into God's heart where it says, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord was sorry and he was grieved in his heart. His heart hurt because of what had happened with this creation that he had made. And then verse 11, the earth was also corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And, and just this week, we've been reminded of the violence in our world, but back then, the earth was filled with violence. And so we know the story of how God called Noah and, and he prepared an ark and, and, and his family was saved from this flood. But then at the end of the flood, turn with me to the end of chapter uh, 8 and verse 21. Noah uh, builds an, an altar and sacrifices a, a sacrifice on this altar. And it says, and the Lord smelled a soothing aroma then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. And I've often puzzled about this, this aroma, this soothing aroma, and, and how it, it somehow moved God. And, um, and then it dawned on me that, this, that the sacrifice was pointing forward to something, wasn't it? It was pointing forward to Jesus who was the sacrifice to save us. And, and it seems to me that God, as he smells the smoke coming up from this sacrifice, he's reminded of his plan to provide whatever necessary to save his people that have been deceived and have wandered away from following him. And then it says in verse 12 of chapter 9, and God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you, that he's not going to destroy us again as he had in the flood. And every living creature that is with you for the perpetual generations, I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. I set my rainbow in the cloud in the cloud. The actual word that is in the Hebrew is simply, I set my bow in the clouds. Now, normally when we think of a bow, we don't think of a rainbow, we think of a weapon, right? A, a, a bow and arrow. And that's actually what is implied here. When, you know, back in the times when, when bows and arrows were the, the main way of defending themselves, when you came into a village, you hoped that you would see the bows hanging above the door of the huts. 
because that would mean that the warriors were home and they weren't off in the woods with their bows pointing them at you. It was safe to come into that kind of a village. And it's this idea that God is saying, you know what, I set my bow up in the cloud. I'm not going to be attacking you. I've changed my mind. I've, I've, I, I'm not going to do what I've just done ever again. And so God makes this covenant with his people, but then it, it's fascinating that in the, in the very next uh, few chapters, uh, in chapter 11, we've got this people that has now populated the earth from, from the, from the um, families of Noah, and what are they doing? What are they building? A tower. Why are they building this tower? It doesn't state it, but it's implied this tower is going to reach high into heaven, and implied is so that if God ever sends another flood, we'll be okay. They didn't believe the promise, the covenant that God had made with them that he had set his bow in the cloud and he was not going to send another flood. But that's not what I want to focus on. I want us to go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2. And let's take a look at creation. So Genesis 1 And verses one, two, and three. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So here you've got this description of this this body of water that was just there. Now there's, there's lots of talk about evolution and how this world is millions of years old. And, and you know, I'm not a scientist, and, and I want to respect what scientists have discovered and the evidence that they have in discovering that, that you know, when they, when they do dating on rocks, these rocks are really, really old. And I want to suggest something to you. What if this body of water was here for a long, long time. And that between verse two and verse three, there could be an unknown period of time. That this body of water, this earth, just in a a chaotic state of, of without form and void, was here, and then in verse three, God began to create on this earth just something for you to perhaps consider and perhaps be able to reconcile some of the evidence that we have for a short-term earth and for a long-term. Something for you to consider. So, we don't know how much time occurred between verse 2 where this, the Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters and then verse 3 where it says, then God said, let there be light and there was light. And he saw the light and it was good and God divided the light from the darkness and he called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. And then God continues to create and I want you to to see something very fascinating in how the creation evolves as he moves from chaos to order and completion. Because in the first day he creates light, in the second day he he creates a firmament, which was basically moving moisture, water, from the earth up into the sky, and so between the water up here and the water here, there was sky, there was firmament. There are a couple of references in the Bible, and I I didn't take the time to... to, um, to, uh, note where it is, I think it's in Isaiah, where it says that the sun was seven times hotter than it is now, and the moon was the heat of our sun. So if, that was the, if that's the case, then how did this earth keep from getting burned up? But if there was a layer of water surrounding this earth, and then outside of that was the sun and the moon at a, a much more intense heat than there is now, then it would kind of create a greenhouse effect 
that this world would have been in, and it would have been the same temperature all around. Just something to consider. So anyway, God separates the waters, and then what does he do? He, he, he separates the water on the earth so that there's water, and then there's dry ground. And so he's, he's created these spaces, and then notice on day four, he puts the sun, moon, and stars in place. Day five, he puts the birds in the sky that he had created on day two. He puts the fish in the sea that he had created on day two. And then on day six, he creates land animals and Adam and Eve so they could inhabit the dry land that he had created on day three. So it's like God creates this space, this form, and then later in the week, he fills it with birds and fish and animals and Adam and Eve. Then what does God create on day seven? It says he rested. Did he create rest? What did he create? I can't hear you. He created the Sabbath day on the seventh day. So I ask you, if he created the Sabbath on the seventh day, what does he fill it with? With what? He rested on the Sabbath, but what does he fill it with? Himself. Exactly. He fills it with himself as he meets with Adam and Eve. And I want to, 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 um, us to take a closer look at this. So let's look at the verses that, that Grant read. Uh, God, verse 31 of chapter one, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. Note that statement, that everything was finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because on it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Why did God rest? Was God tired? No. Isaiah um, I'll just give you the verse, we won't turn to it, but Isaiah 40, 28 says that God doesn't get tired. So it wasn't, he didn't rest because he was tired. He rested because he was finished. Creation was finished. And so he rested, he sanctified and blessed this day. Now I want you just to think for a moment with me what do you think is the opposite of the Sabbath? What would be the opposite of the Sabbath? Any idea? You've probably never thought about that before. So I don't need an answer right now, but hopefully by 1215, you'll have an answer. Because as we understand more about what the Sabbath is, we can understand what the opposite of it is. In uh, his book, The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day, Siv Tonsted says this, the seventh day is like a jar buried deep in the sands of time, preserving a treasure long lost and forgotten. It's a little bit like the Dead Sea Scrolls that were put in those, those clay jars and they were found and, and so they were preserved. But the contents of those jars were more important than the jars themselves. And what he's suggesting is that the seventh day is like a jar to preserve something very valuable, but what was inside that jar is more valuable than the jar itself. So, you know, at Christmas time, we all received some presents. And it's only the very little, little ones that sometimes have more fun with the wrapping than what it wrapped. 
But we know, you know, we're smarter now. We know that the wrapping is, is as fun as that is, there's something inside that's more valuable. And in fact, there's something more valuable than even what's inside, and that is the giver of the gift. What I want to suggest to you is that divorce from its true meaning, we tend to make the Sabbath the most important part instead of the wrapping of something that God intended us to value. We tend to make the Sabbath our Savior instead of our Savior our Sabbath. And so what we've tended to do, if we're not careful, we tend to focus on the day of the Sabbath and so we, we're, we're careful to know that, you know, the Sabbath begins at sundown on Friday till sundown on, Sabbath, on Saturday. And so we even produce sunset calendars so that we know the minute the sun is set and the minute that it sets on the other end. And, and we, we know, we, have, we, don't, we don't actually write out lists, but we kind of know in our minds lists of things that we're not supposed to do on the Sabbath. And we try hard to keep the Sabbath. And, and we, we know the right day, that it's not Sunday, that it's Saturday that is the Sabbath. And sometimes I've heard of people being told that you won't go to heaven unless you keep the Sabbath. And if we're not careful, we make the Sabbath our Savior. Instead of our Savior, the Sabbath. Now, I'm not saying that all these things aren't important about sundown to sundown and the right day of the week, but if that's our whole focus, we've missed what the Sabbath was meant to preserve and contain. And so I want us to look at that today. And so my thesis is this. Everyone should celebrate the awesomeness of the Sabbath because of these realities that the Sabbath reveals about God, that this is why we celebrate the Sabbath. And so the first one is that God longs for intimacy, that that's what the Sabbath reveals to us about God. And what the Sabbath says about God is different than any other world religion or any other culture, in no other world religion or culture do you find a God stopping and spending time with his creation the way the Bible reveals that God does. And so the first thing that God sanctifies is not a hill, not a rock, not a temple or a monument, but a slice of time. Now why do you think that, that is. If you ever have been in Israel, how many of you have been to Israel? A few of you. And, and you know that every prominent place, what is there there? A temple, right? The place where they think that Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, there's a temple there. It's a very nice temple, but there's a temple there. The, you know, where uh, they think Jesus was born, there's a temple there. But Jesus and God, in taking a slice of time, sanctified something that we couldn't control. We couldn't hoard it. We couldn't save it. We couldn't sell it. We couldn't charge people for entering into it. It's a piece of time. And, and, and we can't control it. We, it, it happens. It, it just, time just keeps marching on. And so he sanctifies this time. Because time is precious to God. There's few things that God can't do, but I want to suggest to you that God can't change the past. And so an experience that we have with him on a Sabbath or whenever it is, is forever etched in his memory. And so time is very important. And so moments that we experience with God live on forever in God's memory. The establishment of the Sabbath indicates that he longs for interaction. He's 
stopped everything and he spent time with Adam and Eve. So imagine, this is Adam and Eve's first full day. And then think for a moment what they've missed. They missed God speaking and all of a sudden there was light where before there had been darkness surrounding this earth. Uh, they missed God separating the waters. They missed God speaking and, and the, the, all of a sudden dry land appeared. They missed God speaking and, and, and all of a sudden vegetation grew up out of the dry land like a time-lapse fo photography or uh, photograph. So they had missed a lot that spoke of God's profound power and his majesty. So the first impression that God wants them to have was their encounter with him. It was more profound and more majestic than all these powerful things that had happened earlier in the week. God could have created them and they could have sat with him and watched as he did this, all this creation, but he wanted their first memory, their first realization to be time spent resting with God. It wasn't an oversight on God's part. He had saved the best till last. The silence where there was no magic, there was no phenomena happening. It wasn't how powerful he is, but the fact that he set aside time with him in intimate conversation and togetherness with them. God had found the objects of his love and has no further need for any further work. Karl Barth makes this statement. He says that God rested on the seventh day and blessed and sanctified it is the first divine action that man is privileged to witness and that he himself may keep the Sabbath with God completely free from the work is the first obligation spoken to him and the first expectation laid upon him. It was the first thing that God asked of Adam and Eve was come and spend this time with me. Amazing. Not only is it this their first taste of God, but it is God's first taste of this race. And so the first reality that the Sabbath speaks to us of is that God longs for intimacy with us, his creation. The second reality is that God is fascinated with us. That this time is framed with human existence that God is fascinated with this race, the first thing that they are aware of that Friday evening is God's love for them. Turn with me to Jeremiah 31 and verse 3. Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, where it says, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. God's love is everlasting. It has always been there, and it will always be there. It is everlasting. And so God is fascinated with us. And the Sabbath tells us that. What a compliment that God is fascinated with you and I with individuals, and so every Friday evening, as the Sabbath begins, don't be panicked about what you haven't gotten done, but rest in the fact that you know that God is fascinated with you. Zephaniah talks about God singing with praise over us. Have you ever been so happy that you just can't help it, but burst into song? That's the picture that I get, that God, when he thinks of you, sometimes he just bursts into song. He is so fascinated with you. Every one of us is unique. There is no one just like you. So what you experience with God on the Sabbath is unique to you. 
And if you don't experience that with him on the Sabbath, that peace of God is empty. You can fill only that spot because you are unique. So the memories that you make with God are unique to you. The Sabbath was established before there was sin on this earth. That even if they had never sinned, we would still, God would meet with us on the Sabbath. He is passionate about us. He is fascinated with us. Turn to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43 and verse 1. It says, But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, he formed you, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, and I have called you by your name. You are mine. This verse talks about the fact that God created us, but there's something else there. He also redeemed us. And watch how the Sabbath becomes an important part of these two aspects of what God does. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. And... Um, Let's take a look at the commandment that talks about the Sabbath. Exodus 20 and verse 8. It says 8 and verse 9 and part of verse 10. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall, not, shall do no work. And then drop down to verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So here he's saying, he's reminding them that we are to remember the Sabbath day. Why? Because he created us. But then notice the Ten Commandments are repeated in Deuteronomy. And notice there's a significant difference in the commandment about the Sabbath. So Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. And then drop down to verse 15 and it says, And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So in one statement of the commandments, we are to keep the seventh day as Sabbath because he created us. In the other one, we're to because he redeemed us. He brought them out of Egypt, out of physical slavery, and, and to us, he brings us out of slavery to sin. So he created us and he redeemed us. And so the Sabbath is like a coin with two sides. Redeemed and created. And so according to Moses, creation and redemption have a lot in common. God's creative power and his redeeming power are present as reminders every day seven days of the week, every Sabbath. The Sabbath is a celebration to the Israelites. It's like having a party. You have something to celebrate. When you, when you have a birthday, you, you have a birthday, you've, you've accomplished something, and so you celebrate that. When you have an anniversary, you've accomplished something, you celebrate that. And so the Sabbath is a party to celebrate God's power in creation and right now in our redemption, of redeeming us, of, of transforming us, of changing our hearts. If you've been in Jerusalem and you've gone to the Wailing Wall as the Sabbath begins Friday night, I've been there both times during the week and there's hardly anybody there. There's a few people there, but on Friday night, they come from all over the place and it's crowded. There's 
groups of people and they're singing and they're dancing and they're having a party welcoming in the Sabbath. It's an amazing thing to experience. It really, really is. Because it's a time to remember all the awesome things that God has done in their lives. So the first reality of the Sabbath is that God longs for intimacy. The second is he is fascinated with us. And then the third is the Sabbath is a celebration of God's work and not ours. And so imagine God meeting with Adam and Eve that first Sabbath, that Friday evening. And, 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 and he says, okay, let's celebrate. And they're, they're thinking, but I haven't done anything yet. And that was the whole point. It was a celebration of what God had done, not what they had done. There's a very fascinating connection between Jesus, the cross, and the Sabbath. Remember in Genesis 1, it talks about God sanctifying this day, this slice of time. And then turn with me to Exodus chapter, not Exodus, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 20. And he talks about sanctifying something else other than a day. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. Where it says, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me, between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So God sanctified a day at creation, but now he's telling us, not only do I sanctify time, but I sanctify people. I sanctify you. And then notice in um, Hebrews 10 and verse 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 10. It says, and this, this whole section is, is talking about um, how Christ's death fulfills God's will. And then in verse 10 it says, by that will... We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So our sanctification was accomplished by Jesus for everyone once for all. And so the Sabbath is sanctified at creation it's a reminder that God sanctifies us as people and the cross is a reminder that God is faithful in sanctifying his people. And then turn with me to John chapter 19. John 19, as Jesus is hanging on the cross, as he's in this work of sanctifying people and in John 19, Verse 30, notice what it says. So when Jesus has received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Where else was it said, it is finished? Remember? At the end of day six, which would have been Friday evening, God said, Creation was finished, and it was very good. And now Jesus, as he dies on the cross, and it's Friday night, redemption is finished. After both events, God rests. After the Sabbath in the garden with Adam and Eve, and Jesus in the tomb that was in a garden. And then I want you to Look with me at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians uh, cha uh, chapter 1 and verse, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30.
And notice what it says, and if you don't have this verse marked in your Bible, I urge you to mark it, because listen to what it says. But of him, talking about God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. So we are in Jesus, and Jesus is all of those things for us, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. It's an amazing promise of what Jesus has accomplished for each one of us. And so the purpose of the Sabbath is to point us to this act of sanctification and redemption which took place on Calvary and to point us to Jesus hanging on the cross because Jesus is our Savior and Jesus is our Sabbath because it's in Him and in Him alone that we can rest. The Sabbath is a symbol of resting in God's reality in his creative power and his redemptive power. There's a rabbi that made this statement. He said, the Sabbath kept Israel more than Israel kept the Sabbath. Isn't that awesome? The Sabbath kept Israel more than Israel kept the Sabbath. And we tend to focus on trying hard to keep the Sabbath but really it's there to keep us by being a continual reminder of where we have come from and of to whom we belong and who we don't belong to. And so the Sabbath tells us that God longs for intimacy with us as his people, that he is fascinated with us, and the Sabbath is a celebration of God's work, not ours. And then the last reality is that God is present. The Sabbath tells us that God is present. And and to, to uncover this, I want you to think with me about Jesus when he was here on this earth as God and how he related to people on the Sabbath. All the gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all describe the healing ministry of Jesus on the Sabbath. They give it a major emphasis, and and it it has far-reaching consequences. Because even though the healings are important in their own right, they stand apart because they give rise to heated controversy. Turn with me to John chapter 5 and verse 18. John 5 And verse 18, and notice what it says. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill Jesus because he had not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. We miss the point of the Sabbath healings unless we see the movement from the identity of Jesus to the character of God. Jesus does these things on the Sabbath and that upsets them, but then he talks about how he is doing what the Father is doing. Notice what he says in the next verse, in verse 19 and 20. Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself But what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he does, he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. And so it's more than just what Jesus did, it's Jesus claiming to be doing it in God's name, to be doing what God is doing. That's what really, really upset them. And so Jesus, I want to just describe very briefly two miracles that Jesus does on the Sabbath that described in the Gospel of John. One is he heals uh, the man by the pool of Bethesda on John chapter 5. And and you know the story. He he tells him to to get up and to take up his mat and walk. And, and, And the people, you know, didn't celebrate this miracle because it took place on the Sabbath. And then in John chapter 9, he heals a man who had been born blind. 
He, he, he takes, he makes some mud on the ground and he, 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 he kneads it with his hand, with his fingers and puts it on the man's eyes and tells him to go to the pool and wash. And when he comes back, he can see. Here's a man who had never seen anything and he comes back and, and he was so transformed that people questioned whether it was the same guy. But nobody was asking him, wow, what is it like to be able to see? There's this, this cloud covering over them because it took place on the Sabbath. And so everybody was restrained and, and afraid to celebrate it because something terrible had happened. You see, Jesus throws down the gauntlet by publicly ignoring Jewish Sabbath traditions and regulations. There were 39 prohibitions of things you were not to do on the Sabbath, and, and, and so the mat and the mud were the problem with these two miracles because they knew they weren't to carry a pallet and they weren't to knead dough. And Jesus told this man to carry his mat and he needed the mud to put mud on his eyes and therefore he broke the Sabbath. And yet the Sabbath healings are deliberate actions of Jesus. Jesus' insistence on healing on the Sabbath is best understood when we see that the Sabbath, not as a pride possession of the Jews, but as God's signature statement. To suggest that Jesus actually broke the Sabbath, as his critics do, is to assume wrongly that they had grasped the meaning of the Sabbath. You see, they took the original idea of the Sabbath from creation, when all was at peace and at rest. And they thought, that's how we should keep the Sabbath. But things had changed. By being present and responding to the present reality, that was Jesus' idea of the Sabbath and what it was all about. And so at creation, God's commitment to humanity is described by God's rest, but the reality of disease and death calls for a different Sabbath message. Resting in the face of crying needs implies remoteness and indifference. But God is not like that. God is not remote. God is present. And this is the message written on the Sabbath from the beginning and it's still the message of the Sabbath and Jesus delights in pointing that out. And so he defends his actions by saying, my father is working until now and I am also working. The Jewish religious system that is reflected in the Sabbath conflicts reduces God to a distant player in human affairs. Beyond keeping the universe on course, there's no initiative that they seem to expect on God's part. And the Sabbath has become, has come to epitomize the stalemate of this view that they had the idea that, that if Israel could keep the Sabbath perfectly for one day, then the son of David would come. And yet here is Jesus in their midst explaining that he is doing the works of God. The son of David had shown up in their midst without them keeping this day perfectly and they didn't recognize it. Rather than waiting for the human beings to break the deadlock by impeccable Sabbath observance, Jesus brings the Father's compassion to, the, to view on the Sabbath. G. Campbell Morgan states it this way, there can be no rest for God while humanity is suffering. There can be no rest for God while humanity is suffering. Jesus cannot wait until sundown to minister to these people that are in need. And so he reaches out to heal and to restore and that lies at the heart of God's character and his mission. So fast forward in your minds again to the cross Jesus' voice rings out in that final announcement, it is finished. And these words, which is actually in the Greek is just one word, signify completion. Not the end in an absolute sense, but it's significant that, that he cries out now and there's still the resurrection to take place on Sunday morning 
but he'll not wait till then to cry out, it is finished, because he says it now on Friday night, because the Sabbath is about to begin. Just like creation in Genesis, the heavens and the earth were finished, and the Greek, when they translated the Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek, they used the same word for that finished as for this finish that Jesus declares on the cross. So I remind you of John 1 verse 1 where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so what God had begun by the Word in the days of creation, God finished by the Word in the days of redemption. God has kept the commitment embodied in the Sabbath. So now I ask you, what is the opposite of the Sabbath? Let's just be reminded of what the Sabbath really is all about. It's a celebration of the awesomeness of the Sabbath because of the realities that the Sabbath teaches us about God. That He longs for intimacy, that He is fascinated with us. The Sabbath is a celebration of God's work and not ours because of creation and redemption are both finished. The Sabbath is a reminder that God is present to bring healing and restoration to relationships. So the opposite of the Sabbath would be where there is brokenness and pain, rigid obedience without love, a picture of God that generates fear and coerced service. The Bible describes about a time when people suffer torment and have no rest day or night, which is the exact opposite of what God wants for his people. And so today, rather than become enamored with the clay jar meant to preserve something very special and valuable, and just focus on keeping the Sabbath, may we allow the Sabbath to keep us in an awareness that God is fascinated with us and we celebrate what he has done and that we can truly rest in our Savior and allow him to be our Sabbath. I want you to watch this clip that describes how even though Christmas is over, yet the gift is still present in the Sabbath. No sound? Okay, just, just, let's, let's go straight to our, our closing song then. A day of rest and gladness. I think it's 383. Okay.
<laughs> it's not there. <laughs> Forgive us for becoming enamored with the wrapping and missing the gift that it was intended to preserve. Thank you for what the Sabbath reveals to us about your passion for us. May we allow the Sabbath to keep us close in that relationship with you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>